Hello everyone, Norma Woodcock speaking to you from Perth in Western Australia. I'd like to speak into the Word of God today and the scripture I have chosen for this session is Luke 15 verses 11 to 32, the prodigal son. Focus on the younger son and on the loving father. So I'd like to begin with the sign of the cross in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. He also said a man had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, let me have the share of the estate that would come to me. So the father divided the property between them. A few days later, the younger son got together everything he had and left for a distant country where he squandered his money on a life of debauchery. When he had spent it all, that country experienced a severe famine and now he began to feel the pinch. So he hired himself out to one of the local inhabitants who put him on his farm to feed the pigs. And he would willingly have filled his belly with the husks the pigs were eating, but no one offered him anything. Then he came to his senses and said, how many of my father's paid servants have more food than they want? And here am I dying of hunger. I will leave this place and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your paid servants. So he left the place and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with pity. He ran to the boy, clasped him in his arms and kissed him tenderly. Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the calf we have been fattening and kill it. We are going to have a feast, a celebration. Because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. You know, in my work in the church, this is one of the key messages for people to have a foundation to grow on, which is the love of God. And yet I find so many times that people's perception of the love of God has been distorted because of their life's journey. And as I look at verses 11 to 13, where the youngest son said to the father, I want out of here. I've had enough. I need my share of the estate. And so his father gave it to him. And I wonder for so many people, why do we leave God emotionally? Still go to mass, but emotionally switch off. Emotionally don't really want to trust God. Emotionally don't want to get deeply involved in an intimate life with God. What has happened in their lives? And there are those that have left physically, no longer going to mass. So somehow this young man had a problem with his father and with the environment and he decided to leave. And when I work with people, particularly in the area of spiritual direction, there are several things that I need to look at. One is fear of intimacy. I remember many, many beautiful young ones that I've worked with in my 40 years and they don't want to get too close to God. So they don't want to go into a deeper, intimate prayer. And when I ask them why, this is what I've been told. If God really got too close to me, he might not like what he sees. And so we have to work then in the area of a God who is good, a God who is loving, a God who is enormously merciful. And yet as I journey through my journey with people, sometimes they've been hurt. Prayers have not been answered. They don't understand why their prayers have not been answered. That person wasn't healed and yet somebody else's person got, their friend got better or, or that job didn't happen or that marriage didn't happen or the relationship didn't work out. And I understand that because I was abused as a little girl very severely and I also lost a little baby full term and she died and I understand that pain. And do you know what happened to me? I made a vow way back then when my baby died and I said, nobody's ever looked after me. I will now look after myself. And God got just put into that box as well. And I did, and I left church. And I left the love of God and the life of God. Another reason why people turn away from God emotionally and even physically is sinfulness. They do not believe that this amazing God can forgive whatever sins. And in the world we live in today, 
and I want to say this because I come across it often, pornography robs our young people and our older people of their sense of self. And they say, well, nobody knows about it. This is a secret, but God knows about it. And what God is wanting is for you, whoever you may be, to say to him, I want healing, freedom, I want to change. And this merciful God immediately embraces you. There is no sin too great. There is no sin too great. But I want to focus on something else that is of vital importance, I feel. Because of maybe the way we were taught about religion, maybe the way God was expressed to us, we fear this God. But more importantly, I want to ask this. Sometimes our human fathers gave us an example that wasn't God-filled example. And so what we do quite often is we pray to the heavenly version of our human father. If our human father was strict, well then God is strict. If he was stingy, then God is stingy. If he wasn't merciful, then God's not merciful. If he compared you with the, with the siblings, God compares you all the time. So this distorted image of God can come from our human fathers who did the best with what they had. However, we have to be honest and we have to say, sometimes what they said or didn't say, did or didn't do, has affected us to today. So these distorted images, the sense of sinfulness, the fear of intimacy, being hurt and blaming it on God and everyone around us, these reasons we run away. We run away and we hide from God. So I'm going to verses 14 to 20 now. When he had spent it all, that country experienced a severe famine and now he began to feel the pinch. So he hired himself out to one of the local inhabitants who put him on his farm to feed the pigs. And he would willingly have filled his belly with the husks the pigs were eating, but no one offered him anything. Then he came to his senses and said, how many of my father's paid servants have more food than they want? And here am I dying of hunger. I will leave this place and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you and I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your paid servants. So he left the place and he went back to his father. I would like to say he still had a servant mentality. He was bargaining with God, bargaining with his father. And we bargain with God. If I do this, then God will do that. And this is what this young son was saying. If I go back to my father and I say, put me on as one of your paid servants. I will be a paid servant if you will take me back. And God's not into bargaining. God's into generosity and abundance and grace that is free. While he was still a long way off, verses 20 to 24, his father saw him and was moved with pity. He ran to the boy, clasped him in his arms and kissed him tenderly. Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the calf we have been fattening and kill it. We are going to have a feast, a celebration, because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. You know, I've worked with students, primary school students, with this story, and I do it in a, in, in a demonstrative way about the father looking with his hand to his eyes and coming out in the morning and then looking at midday and at the end of the day, looking down the road for his, his son. Maybe now he's coming back, maybe now. Anyway, this school booked me a year later, and I said to these beautiful young uh, primary school students, do you remember me coming last year and this little boy put his hand to his eyes and he said, looking, looking, God's looking. I thought that was pretty good that he remembered that a year later. But this God, who we want to serve and love with every fibre of our being, wants us to know that he is good and that he doesn't hold anything against us. And so I just need to briefly share now, I was like the prodigal, went off, lived my own life, and then I had a conversion experience. I was in hospital and my brother came to visit me and he said a few words that changed my life and this is what he said. The thing is, Norma, God won't wait forever. Now we know God is the hound of heaven and he will wait forever. 
But what happened in what he had to say was this, the hospital room was filled with a presence of love. And what I sensed in that moment was that God wanted me. And I want to say to you with everything I have within me, God wants you. Deeper than where you are today. More intimate than where you are today. Not bargaining, not just out of obedience, but opening your heart to him so that he can flood your heart with amazing grace. He can heal the wounds inside you. He can restore your relationships. And so in that moment of enormous love filling that hospital room, I gave my life back to God. And can I tell you, restoration has happened and is happening for me all the time. I'm on a journey, you're on a journey, but the message for today is, no matter what has happened in your life, return to him now and say to him, I come back bruised, broken, sinful, take me back. And I can tell you, God says, yes, at last, you have come home. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for listening. God bless you. My life is a miracle. Every child has a story of God's love to share. Shalom world, tune into God's love story.